Hello everybody and welcome to week 14 of the Bring Back the Salmon Classroom Hatchery program. This week is going to be our last week where we have a guest presenter. It's also going to be the last week that we hear a fishy fact from Johnny. Now we still have one more episode after this, but that episode is going to be jammed full with the collection and then release of our fish in two different restoration streams. So this week's presenter is Adam Weir, and Adam is the fisheries biologist here at the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. Adam is going to be speaking about climate change and the impacts of climate change on fish. But before I turn it over to Adam, I want to speak about and give thanks for a really important area here on Earth, and that area is called the biosphere. The biosphere is the global ecosystem where all of the biota, which means living organisms, all of the biota of Earth exist. This zone stretches from the tips of the highest mountains down to the bottom of the deepest parts of the ocean, a thickness of approximately 12 kilometers wrapping around the entire Earth. This may seem like a huge area, and in many ways it is. But when you consider that the Earth is over 12 and a half thousand kilometers in diameter, and the Earth's atmosphere extends thousands of kilometers above the Earth's surface, the biosphere is relatively very thin. The water, carbon, nitrogen, and other biological and chemical cycles contained within the biosphere are very complex and are influenced by abiotic, which is non-living, and biotic, which is living, factors. These cycles interact with each other and dictate things like our climate. What we do to this thin layer called the biosphere matters. This is our home and we need to take care of it. Okay, so let's check on our hatcheries. So this is our warmer tank with the fry swimming around. The fry are getting more and more active every single day and they're feeding really well. Today I'm starting to feed them twice a day. And I'm also going to be doing another water change. I'll change about a quarter of the water in there and clean the filters again. And I've been noticing there's a couple of bigger ones in here. I think this is one of them here. And this fish is a little bit aggressive. It's a bit of a bully. It's chasing other fish around, especially when the food comes in, which gives a little bit of an indication that maybe we can add a little bit more food because we don't want to have it so that just the aggressive fish are the ones that are getting food. So we'll, we'll make sure that the other fish are getting food as well. While we're down here, we can actually see that our equipment's working as well. You can see the bubbles coming in from the water coming out of that filter. And that one over there. And our aerator's running right there. Temperature is sitting just a little touch over 12 degrees. That's good. So today I am going to start feeding twice a day and I'm going to change about a quarter of the water in there again, clean the filters. And I'm also going to remove some of these rocks. The fish don't seem to be using them anymore and food that's sinking down could be getting stuck down in that gravel and not being accessible for the fish. So I'm going to remove about half of the gravel in this tank today. Tank's looking great. Let's go and check the other one. Okay, so our cooler tank, the river tank, still covered up. 
because inside of here we have Alvin. And I've seen one fish today. They're pretty much all hidden away. Uh, there was one fish in the corner and it looked pretty much like it did two weeks ago. So there's still Elvin, there's still sack fry, and they're hiding in the gravel, just like they should be. So our filter's working, our aerator's working, our temperature is sitting right about three degrees currently. And so we're gonna wanna release these fish in a couple of weeks. So we have to get them to develop a little bit more before they're ready to go into the restoration stream. So starting today, I'm slowly, very, very slowly increasing the temperature, um, maybe about a degree Celsius every couple of days, which is going to increase their metabolic rate and get them using up that yolk sac so that ideally they have just use that yolk sac up when we release them into the stream. So we're going to start doing that today. But other than that, this is all working perfectly as well. Hi there, my name is Adam Weir. I'm the fisheries biologist for the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. I'm here to present the classroom hatchery program, and we're going to talk about climate change and the impacts on fish. So just as a general overview, I'll provide an introduction and background to myself and the organization. Uh, we'll be explaining what climate change is and greenhouse gases and human activities scientific consensus around climate change, climate change and the impacts on fish, case studies, as well as how uh, we can all do our part in slowing the effects of climate change. So again, background for myself, my name is Adam Weir, work for the OFAH. It's Ontario's largest nonprofit fish and wildlife conservation based organization and we represent 100,000 members, subscribers and supporters, 725 member clubs. Typically I work on government proposals and advocate on behalf of Ontario's angling community, as well as I uh, participating on various advisory councils, working groups, committees, typically dealing with um, fisheries management, planning, regulation development, issues, concerns and all sorts of things. So some of my past experiences is that uh, I've been a longtime angler ever since I was uh, a little kid. I think I've had a rod in my hand and I was introduced into hunting, particularly bow hunting in my early 20s. I went to school for engineering, but quickly decided that I didn't want to be an engineer and I pursued a career in fish and wildlife. I've done a variety of um, outdoor and environmental job experiences, say, for example, with conservation authorities, including Queenie Conservation, Central Lake Ontario Conservation Authority, uh, and the Toronto Region Conservation Authority. I worked as an animal care committee intern and a field camp technologist at Fleming College. I was a project manager for renewable energy projects across uh, Northern Ontario, as well as doing natural heritage assessments and other environmental impact assessments with that job. Uh, I worked on Baffin Island Nunavut in the Arctic, uh, primarily doing geotechnical surveys as well as uh, bird surveys. And I also worked for a remote fishing and hunting lodge in northern, um, northwestern Ontario, where I worked and lived for a while. Okay, so let's talk about climate change. So we're going to kickstart the conversation and describe what climate change actually is. We'll talk about greenhouse gases and the greenhouse gas effect, human activities that contribute to greenhouse gas emissions, as well as a scientific consensus around climate change. What is climate change? So climate change can be described as a long-term shift in weather conditions related to things like temperature, precipitation, wind, snow cover, and other indicators. It could be caused by a couple different things. So this could be natural processes and human activities. Natural processes would include uh, solar radiation from the sun, for example, or volcanic dust that's trapped in the atmosphere. Whereas with human activities, it comes from burning of fossil fuels like coal and oil and through the emissions of greenhouse gases and other substances. So the real cause for concern here is the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. 
What are greenhouse gases? So these are gases in the atmosphere that absorb heat radiated from the earth. So it's just like the way the glass of a greenhouse warms and traps the air inside. This is why we use the term greenhouse. So concentrations of greenhouse gases have increased significantly since pre-industrial times, particularly from 1950 till, till now. And this has been contributed by the burning of fossil fuels as well as deforestation. So this increase is, has exacerbated the greenhouse effect and the warming of the planet planet and has impacted things like weather patterns, precipitation, and storm events. So this is a quote that I like. It's from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and they state that continued emission of greenhouse gases will cause further warming and long-lasting changes in all components of the climate system, increasing the likelihood of severe, pervasive, and irreversible impacts for people and ecosystem. So it's definitely a cause for concern, not only for humans, but for our ecosystems as well. So here's a little depiction of what's going on with the greenhouse gas effect. Let me just play this here. Sun reaches the Earth. Some energy is reflected back into space. Some is absorbed and re-radiated as heat. And most of the heat is absorbed by greenhouse gases and then radiated in all directions, which warms the Earth. So this comes from NASA, actually, this nice little graphical depiction of what is going on. So what human activities contribute the most to greenhouse gases in the atmosphere? We already talked about this a little bit. So again, the burning of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas. Fossil fuels are used for everyday things like transportation, manufacturing, heating, cooling, electricity, generation, and other applications. So these things that we always need day to day in our lives really um, contributes to the burning of fossil fuels. And it's also human land use activities as well. This could be ranching and agriculture and the clearing uh, and deforestation of our forests and natural environments. Here's another quote from the IPCC. So the warming of the climate system is unequivocal and since the 1950s, many of the observed changes are unprecedented over decades to millennia. This is a nice graphical depiction we have here. So it shows historical information related to carbon dioxide levels that we've had in the Earth's atmosphere. This comes from ice core samples, and it has this comparison to the 1950 level and where we are currently. And you can see that for millennia, we have not gone over this, this level. And you can see that significant increase from the Industrial Revolution until now. So now we're basically building an argument here and providing some scientific consensus around climate change and the associated impacts, greenhouse gases and the warming of the planet. And so these quotes that I've provided from the IPCC, again, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, this comes from a synthesis report on climate change and is based on reports of three working groups that are part of the IPCC. So this is an organization of governments that are members of the United Nations or the World Meteorological Organization. They have 195 members and thousands of people from all over the world contribute to the work of the IPCC. So um, NASA, they note that multiple studies published in peer-reviewed scientific journals show that greater than 97% of actively publishing climate scientists agree and back to quotes because I love them, climate warming trends over the past century are extremely likely due to human activities. In addition, most of the leading scientific organizations worldwide have issued public statements endorsing this position. I think we can really jump back to that graphical depiction that showed historically what was going on through the ice core samples that were taken in 1950 and part of the Industrial Revolution, uh, what went on with human activities then and then greater than half a century later where we are in our current situation. So climate change and fish. So what is expected to happen? So we know that there's going to be an increase in air and water temperature. There'll be a decrease in ice and snow cover, and there'll also be changes in the timing and amount of precipitation that's going on. So how will this impact fish and fisheries? I like this quote from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. It comes from a report they did on brook trout in Ontario, but really this applies to pretty much all fish. Is that temperature is critical to survival and for regulating physiological processes in fish. So an increase in water temperature will affect the distribution of fish, the growth, the reproductive uh, patterns, and the survival of fish as well. It, 
uh, climate change will lead to more nutrients, hydrological modifications, habitat degradation and loss, pollution, and also the spread and distribution of invasive species will also increase. What I'd like to do now is jump into some more specific examples of climate change and the impacts on fish. So we'll do a few case studies. We'll jump into a couple cold water species, which include lake trout and brook trout. And then we'll talk about some cool water species. That would be the walleye and the yellow perch. And we'll finish off the conversation on the spotted gar. So let's talk about the lake trout. It is a sensitive cold water fish species, requires deep, well oxygenated cold water habitat. So it's long lived, it's slow growing, it matures at a late age, has low reproductive potential and low recruitment and replacement rates. So with climate change, we expect to see an anticipated loss of thermal habitat volume and quality. So we'll see this area within the water column that it really needs and it'll just shrink it essentially. Also, with climate change, we expect that this will um, improve habitat conditions for invasive species and competitors that will outcompete the lake trout as well. Moving on to another cold water species, the brook trout. So with climate change, we'll see declining water levels and decreased flow, which will reduce critical spawning and rearing habit habitat for the brook trout. This will increase habitat loss and will fragment habitat as well and potentially restrict access to spawning grounds. So with an increased water temperature, we'll see a decrease in the availability of cold water habitat for them to carry out their life processes. And again, just like the lake trout and being a sensitive species too, with climate change, we'll likely see a greater distribution of invasive species and them infiltrating these areas where brook trout are and um, competing with them and out competing these species. Moving on to cool water species. So let's talk about the walleye. Gonad development is primarily driven by temperature and photo period. The gonads are the reproductive parts to the fish. So walleye require extended winters of three to five months with mean temperatures below 10 degrees Celsius for adequate gonad development. So short winters, which are characterized by being less than three months, or warm winters, which are have mean temperatures that are above 15 degrees Celsius, can lead to poor ovary development, decrease in egg size, and decrease in reproductive success, as well as an increase in egg mortality. So we can really see how climate change and the warming of the planet could potentially negatively impact the species. However, um, there's also studies that indicate that the warming of the planet may increase available habitat for the species and models suggest that they could actually increase their range and distribution within the province. Moving on to another cool water fish species, the yellow perch, which is closely related to the walleye. Under certain climate change scenarios, we can actually see them benefit. So with increased precipitation, we will likely see an increase in river discharge. And larval yellow perch really rely on this discharge because it creates these um, large, turbid, cloudy plumes where they seek and find refuge to avoid predation and still allowing them to feed. However, just like the walleye, with shorter winters that we would expect to see with climate change, they will likely negatively, negatively impact ovary development and the reproductive success of the yellow perch. Lastly, I would like to talk about the spotted gar. So this is a pretty unique species we have in Canada, and it's one of the rarest freshwater species we have in the country as well. It's listed as endangered under Ontario's Endangered Species Act and the Federal Species at Risk Act. So the habitats that it likes is backwater, quiet bays that are warm and dense with vegetation and shallow. They're tolerant of these warm waters and low dissolved oxygen and can survive in these conditions for a long time. One interesting point to mention about the spotted gar is that they can actually gulp air, bring that air into their swim bladder and absorb oxygen that way, not just using their gills. The range of the spotted gar is really limited in Ontario due to cool water temperatures. So under climate change and the warming conditions we would expect is that this may actually allow them to expand their distribution and the range, as well as improving their migration and dispersal opportunities in the province. However, and conversely, climate change scenarios have also demonstrated that common reed distribution will, will expand and the range will expand. And this reduces the amount of preferred available habitat for the spotted gar. Also, other studies conducted by Fisheries and Oceans Canada indicated that the spotted gar is highly vulnerable to climate change and the impacts this has on coastal wetlands. 
Let's do a recap here on climate change in fish. So some impacts are predictable. We talked about sensitive cold water species like lake trout and brook trout. And under most, if not all, climate change scenarios is that these species will likely not do well with warming conditions and other weather events brought on by climate change. Whereas tolerant and warm water species, there may be predictable impacts. It could actually benefit these species. They could be climate change winners. So other outcomes are less predictable, like with cool water species. The perkids we talked about, walleye and yellow perch, is that you know we have these benefits that are potentially going to occur, but they're often contrasted by negative impacts as well. So basically, in a nutshell, there are lots of uncertainties and unknowns, and it's really hard to predict the impacts of climate change and what they'll have on species. But I think we can broadly say is that the pace of climate change is unprecedented and already stressed aquatic ecosystems will be faced with even greater challenges into the future. So I'd like to end the presentation today with actions that we can all do to help slow the impacts of climate change. So be energy efficient by greening your home. Choose green power, uh, plant trees, riparian plantings and maintaining native vegetation and trees along the shore. Choose sustainable transportation, conserve water, incorporate green infrastructure into your landscape, eat locally, reduce your waste, rethink, refuse, reduce, reuse, repair, and recycle. The six R's, not just the three R's, and get involved and informed. And some of the best ways you can do this is getting a fishing and hunting license. So all of the licensed sales in the province of Ontario go straight into the special purpose account. And this money is used for the management and conservation of our fish and wildlife resources. It's used for monitoring and assessing our fish and wildlife as well. And it goes right back into these resources to benefit them and anglers and hunters. So also join a conservation organization. A lot of these actions you can really do through an organization and be a part of something that is bigger than just yourself. And just as a recap of what we talked about today is that we did a breakdown of climate change, the causes, the impacts, human involvement, as well as the scientific consensus around climate change. We talked about climate change and the impacts to fish. We did a several case studies on indigenous species we have in Ontario, as well as ways we can all slow the effects of climate change. I'd like to take the time to thank everybody for participating in this presentation. It is a complicated subject with no clear answer, lots of uncertainties and unknowns, but hopefully I provided a little bit of information that was understandable related to climate change and the impacts on fish. And stay safe, stay healthy, take care. Hello everyone. Thanks for checking out this week's segment of Fishy Facts. I'm Johnny Nene. This week, we're going to talk about an incredibly fast fish, the sailfish. Sailfish are an epipelagic billfish found throughout the temperate and warm parts of the world's oceans. Epipelagic refers to the part of the ocean where sunlight penetrates, allowing for photosynthesis to occur, and is typically about 200 meters deep. Sailfish can reach up to 3 meters in length, and weigh upwards of 220 pounds. Their upper jaw extends into an elongated bill, which they use to stun their prey. Sailfish also have a large dorsal fin that resembles a ship's sail, which is where their name comes from. Sailfish feed on squid, octopus, and fishes, such as anchovies, mackerel, sardines, jacks, and needlefish, among others. Sailfish will hunt in groups to increase their success. They use their large dorsal fin to herd schools of small fish while alternating attacks from either side of the school. This makes it difficult for the prey to predict where an attack will come from. It also helps that sailfish are widely considered the fastest fish in the ocean. They can reach speeds up to 110 kilometers per hour, making escape even tougher for their prey. Sailfish will often venture closer to shore than other billfishes, making them accessible to recreational anglers. Sailfish flesh is quite tough, and they are not typically sought after for their meat, 
but they are considered a prized game fish for recreational anglers and they are often targeted around the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. When hooked, sailfish put up a tremendous fight and they will often make acrobatic leaps out of the water to try to shake the hook. A fight could last multiple hours. Well, that's all I have for you guys for this week's segment of Fishy Facts. I hope you enjoyed learning about the sailfish and be sure to check out next week's segment. Thanks everyone. Thanks for watching week 14 of the Bring Back the Salmon Classroom Hatchery program. And thank you to Adam for this week's presentation. And a huge thank you to Johnny, not only for this week's episode of Fishy Facts, but for all the episodes of Fishy Facts that he's provided for this program. Be sure to join us for the next Classroom Hatchery episode when we're gonna be taking the fish out of our tanks, bringing them to a restoration stream, and releasing them into the wild.